Can you can you see? Can you see the screen? Yes, it's visible. All right. So, uh, Rana, should I start with the presentation? Yeah, sure, sure, sir. You can start. Okay. Thank you. Okay. okay. So, assalamualaikum, everyone. Uh, welcome to the to today's presentation, uh, in which uh, we'll be talking about how to make a financial model. Um, so, today's presentation is going to be divided on what financial model really is, uh, some guidelines to uh, to how to, you know to to guide you how to approach this thing or this project. Uh, then we'll head straight into uh, seeing how financial statements are forecasted and how we value a company. And uh, before I end the presentation and hand it over to Q&A, uh, we'll, we'll talk about a few best practices, uh, uh, you know, that comes with this, uh, with financial model. So, so what is financial model? Again, it's a very fancy term. Uh, a lot of people uh, use it. You know, a lot of people would brag about it. Uh, well, if let's say you wanted to spend uh, your invest your money, uh, and this is your life saving, you're earning. Uh, you just begun earning, and you you're uh, investing about 20, 25 percent of it. So you wanted to be you want to be very careful with it. Where you investing your money, right? Uh, and you want to do your research, you want to talk to people. So you want to take an informed decision uh, with your money and invest, invest it in a, in a safer or a risk free asset or you know something, an asset with a low risk. And you know what kind of risk you're getting into, right? So financial modeling is one of the tools that can help you make an informed decision. Uh, it is in practice, it's just an Excel file in which we will forecast financial statements of a company and our ultimate goal will be to value that company which will eventually help us decide whether or not we want to invest in the security in this case we will just be talking about a stock a company but it can be a fixed income asset it can be a derivative it can be a credit uh, it can be a loan that you want to uh, uh, you know give as at a bank so financial to, uh, financial modeling is used for all those purposes. Uh, like I said, since we're just involved with uh, you know modeling a company today, our main concern or or what we're trying to come out with is earnings and a value for the company, target price or fair value. And uh, before you start, you know again, you know it it to some people it might be an overwhelming term. Uh, I would like to tell you that it's not that difficult. It's not rocket science. Uh, and once you get the hang of it, it's, it's generally fun. Uh, but you, you, you want to have some basic understanding of economics, accounting, financial theory. And of course, since it's used, uh, made on Microsoft Excel, you are expected to know some, uh, you know, better than basic skills of uh, Excel. So once you have that, and then you mix it with your understanding of an industry and company, you're good to go. You're you're ready to to make a financial model. Uh, again, you know, it's it's a tool, it's a skill that can definitely improve your employability if you can put it on your resume, and you will be. Uh, this is something that uh, a potential employer, particularly in the financial institutions uh, and even corporates, uh, would would give credit to because it's a skill that your potential employer might take time to teach you, and you are already coming with that skill. So it's definitely something that you should familiarize yourself with. Uh, and like I said, you know, again, it's not rocket science. If you if you're someone who like numbers, if you're someone who like things working in a logical fashion, if you're someone who likes art and design, I think it's got something to appeal to all of you. So you know, don't don't be overwhelmed by it. It's a fun exercise. I hope you have fun making your own model. 
Okay, some basic gu guidelines. Uh, again, if you look at uh, 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 an annual report and you're looking at all those numbers and you know, you might think you would have to forecast each and every line item in in the balance sheet and in the uh, income statement and, and cash flow statement and whatnot. Well, the thing is, uh, uh, you know, we uh, use a 80-20 rule. You might have heard this term uh, in one of your management courses. Uh, what it means is that you spend 80% of your time on 20% of the things that matter the most and the remaining 20% of your time on everything else. So you focus your attention on those variables which matter the most. And be, you know, keep that in mind, our, our, our focus and our purpose of this entire project is to find out the earnings and a fair value of a company. One guiding principle that can uh, basically tell you what is important, what is what matters, and what you should focus your attention on is the DCF rule. Um, and again, I hope you're familiar with this formula. It's the free cash flow to the firm. And uh, I want you to focus on the three components that I've underlined here. If you see the first component, it's effectively coming off uh, the income statement. And in a way, it's encompassing the entire income statement of a company. Uh, the other two terms, working capital and fixed asset investment or CapEx, are coming off the balance sheet. So in a way, this formula is in capturing both the income statement and balance sheet. But the important point here is within the balance sheet, the most important numbers that you are worried that you that you care about and that will matter in your ultimate goal is the working capital and the CapEx. Uh, of a of a company, so you want to you want to focus on the items which are constituting uh, working capital and capex, and we'll come to that a little later. But this is the guiding principle. You want to focus your attention on these, and this this is the twenty percent that you would want to give eighty percent of your time to. Another uh, important thing to know is the quality of the financial model is not just dependent or not entirely dependent on how good you are at Excel, right? It depends on how good your research is, how well you understood the sector, the company, and the and the quality of the model in terms of the outcome will be just as good as your research. So the emphasis is on understanding the company well, reading as much as you can do uh, before you start making the model, and you know you you don't just want to read the recent annual report. You also want to go back in time, read uh, what happened in in the past, and understand what the industry is like and how it you know performed over economic cycles. And while you're at it, you also want to talk to people within the industry uh, who are related to that uh, industry that you're covering or uh, the company that you're looking at. Uh, and try to get more information and increment what you've read uh, about this company. Again, in a lot of sectors, uh, you are you know faced with data, you know data issues. For instance, you you may not have enough data to work with. Uh, some companies don't disclose much. Uh, you know, sometimes the data is not very reliable. You know. So it's not a perfect world, but there are ways to working around it, and we just have to be smart. So you know, remember that as well. When you come across something that's sort of cryptic or difficult to understand, not just in this project, in any financial model that you work on in future, just be smart about it. You can't always have a perfect world. The data is not going to be perfect. You have to fill the loopholes with your intelligence, with your research. And while you're making the model, I think it's it'll be very useful and very time efficient for you guys. When you're putting, uh, you're punching in the numbers from the the uh, financial statements, or you're making the formulas to forecast. Knowing Excel shortcuts will you know take you a long way. It will really improve your uh, Excel skills, but it will also make you very fast at uh, making your model. So I'm going to get into the, the real thing now. Uh, 
how we forecast the financial statements of the company. For today's presentation, I've chosen a, a hypothetical uh, cement company. Um, and I understand the company that you'd be looking at is also cement, so it might be uh, uh, useful for you. And I'll tell you how I went about making the model of this company and, uh, uh, and, and what, what was the thought process. So in any model, you would want to start off with having the basic assumptions uh, that, that will, you will use uh, uh, you know, while you're making the model. And for most sectors, these are going to be the same. You would want to have an estimate of the GDP growth because you know it could be it could be a good guide to what my volumes are growing like in future. Inflation, of of course, cost is something that you're going to deal with throughout this project, and inflation is a is is one variable which affects cost. Rupee, rupee, of course, if let's say you're dealing with a sector which either exports or import its raw materials or inputs, in that case, you would be concerned and you would be using the exchange rate. So you would want estimates for exchange rate into the future. And likewise, interest rates and some of the commodity prices which are relevant to your sector. In this case, coal is a critical one, right? Uh, and again, of course, I understand very well that you guys are not economists, you're not analysts yet. Uh, so these a good source to look for projections for for you know future macros uh, is IMF projections or World Bank projections. You can readily find them on their website on Pakistan, uh, and uh, so that could be a good source if you can if you find the State Bank writing uh, something on on one of these variables or giving its forecast. That's very useful. Uh, so you can use sources like these. To, uh, to start with. Uh, so I'm gonna jump onto the first uh, financial statement. And if you remember the DCF rule, the, the first component we dealt with was EBIT after tax. And effectively, that means I have to be worried about the entire income statement, right? There's nothing, uh, you, you know. So, uh, so, in the income statement, you start off with net sales and you go in the same order. So let's say you've taken down the historical numbers uh, of, of uh, the income statement and balance sheet and uh, 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 cash flow statements. You've taken down your macro assumptions. Now is the time to start forecasting the, uh, the future financial statements. So the first step, of course, is to find out what sales will this company have? Uh, and when you say sales or revenues, it is a product of volumes and price. So P into V. So I want to know what my volumes are going to be like in future. And I'm I want to know what at what price I'll sell that, those volumes, right? Uh, one way to forecast volumes, again, uh, this company that I've used, is called Black Cement Corporation. I'm gonna use that name uh, throughout this presentation, so please follow. So BCC or Black Cement Corporation, you know, uh, I've taken down its capacity, its past cement sales, and, and now I have to figure out what future sales are going to be like. One way to do that, again, and it's a very simple way, you can take the GDP uh, growth, uh, expectations and you can grow cement by that much. Uh, so, so, so cement sales of the industry or of the company are growing as much as the overall GDP is growing because it's a very cyclical commodity. It goes along with the economy. Uh, so it's, it's not a bad proxy to use uh, for, for forecasting future volumes, but you would want to be a little more detailed about it. So what I've done here is, and, uh, it's again, your understanding of the industry matters a lot. So the cement sector is a net exporter. So it has surplus capacity and surplus production and it exports whatever it can't sell in Pakistan, right? Uh, but most of the sales are in Pakistan only. And as you see, it, it is operating at about 80% its capacity. 
uh, in the past five years. So it's it's got excess capacity. So it's not as if any cement producer has the power to sell as much as he uh, he uh, as as the plant wants. Uh, they'll have a certain market share. And you'll have to figure out how those market shares were determined. Does it depend on the geography or the quality of the cement they produce or, or you know, uh, or the price? Uh, so, and so I've forecasted what my industry sales will be like. Again, just to be simple here, I've used the GDP growth assumption. You can take on, you can uh, you use a better measure uh, for forecasting what, uh, uh, cement sales of the industry will be like, and I've taken exports to be flat. It's a smaller component of the overall sales. And now I'm gonna, uh, once I've done the industry volumes, now I want to decide and work on what my company will sell. And if I look back into the future, as far as the local sales are concerned, this company VCC has been consistently selling about seven percent of the overall industry sales. So that's a good starting point and I can use that number. But again, uh, you would want to investigate and dig a little deeper why that market share was 7% only and do you have enough reason to assume that it'll be the same in future or whether it'll increase uh, or decrease. And you know that, that again, your research. Exports again, it's a smaller component, so I've just taken it flat into the future. So I've, by now, what I've done is I've forecasted industry volumes. I've assumed BCC will sell about 7% of those volumes. And that gives you me uh, the volumes for my company, uh, including exports. And now the next step for me is to figure out the price, right? So I've, again, I have historical prices. And what I see is, uh, uh, you know, it has had a CAGR of 8%. That's very nearly uh, the average inflation in Pakistan over that period. Uh, but that's one way of looking at it. So what I'll do is I'll increase uh, future prices, the retail uh, per bag price of uh, cement uh, by let's say I, I, I increased it by 6%. Uh, but this is, this is the gross price, right? Uh, this is the price that consumer pay. And it will include taxes and other components which the company is not pocketing. Sometimes it will include discounts that the dealer will take. Uh, so what price is the company pocketing? It's the net, it's, we call it the retention price. And this is that price which will go into the net sales of the company. So this would comprise the gross sales and this will be the net sales. Again, this you know this was a simple approach where I used a certain CAGR of the past and assumed it'll be the same in future, but it's not as simple, right? It goes through economic cycles. There'll be period where cement prices would fall and there'll be periods when they will rise very sharply because demand is good. And it'll have to come down on what sort of macro assumptions you're taking and what sort of outlook you have on the economy and on the industry, right? So prices will uh, will be a function of that as well, not just a certain growth rate applied. Uh, so, and another way of uh, looking at prices, so cement industry can, you know, since it's more localized, there's, very, there's absolutely no competition with imports. Uh, so they have got the pricing power, right? As an industry. So, there's, when you when you see an industry like that, you know most likely they will have a cost plus pricing formula, right? So I need to figure out what their cost will be and what sort of margins they've had in the past, and I'll forecast the cost at the margin, uh, and that'll be the price at which the company or the industry will operate. And this is what I've done over here. I've looked at what this company uh, has uh, the cost of its raw material per ton of cement, the cost of its energy per ton of cement, labor cost per ton of cement, and other cost per ton of cement. So these are all the costs. This is the price that it realized. So it uh, had a margin of very nearly, in fact, it's between 20% and 30%. If we ignore this year, which was affected by COVID, so the the company has been able to book a, a margin of 20, 20, 20 to 30% over its cost 
in the past five years. And that could be a start, good starting point for you. So you will focus the cost of the company and you and you'll assume that it'll operate at a certain margin over that cost and that will give you a price. Uh, the only problem with this approach is it can lead to circular reference. I can come back to that term a little later and that's why I've not used this approach over here. Uh, but circular reference is something that you would want to avoid in any Excel file, not just a financial model and which is why I've not used it, but there are ways to working around it and avoiding circular references, which we can talk about later. Exports, uh, again, uh, if you look at the realized prices, and this is based on, since I have the volumes and from the statements, I also have the export revenues. I can figure out what export prices uh, uh, or effective export price this company sold at. And again, it's very nearly $45 per ton. Uh, so I'm assuming uh, export prices of around 40 in future. Uh, and uh, I'm, uh, you know, of course I have the exchange rate in my assumptions and I'll, you know, change that to rupees and that'll be my export price multiplied with the export volumes that I have. And that's how I will get the revenue. It's a very basic P into V analysis uh, where I've forecasted volumes and prices and that's how I reach the, uh, the revenue. So we're, we're done with one very critical part of, of my income statement and, and you know, uh, frankly, a very critical part of the entire model, which is the sales of this company. The next one, of course, is cost. And uh, when, you're, when you're talking about cost, uh, again, if you, if you look at uh, this screen, this is uh, of, the financial statements of one of these companies, cement companies in Pakistan. So it's got a long list of items that you uh, have to uh, forecast, right? And uh, the way to go about it, if you remember the 80-20 rule, so I want to focus on the, the bigger cost, right? And uh, the other smaller pieces of the cost can be clubbed into one and I can cost, uh, you know, forecast it together. So that's what's happening here. The raw material, the energy cost and salaries and repair and maintenance, these, these were the, the big ones, right? And this is where I've devoted most of my attention. The others I've clubbed into one group and I'm going to forecast it together. Uh, for any industry, you would imagine the raw material would be the largest cost, but that's not the case in cement. Uh, Raw material uh, uh, for cement, limestone, and gypsum are abundantly available in Pakistan, and they're not, uh, you know, they're, they're cheap. So that's why they, the the raw material cost comprises a smaller portion of uh, your to overall cost. The energy cost is larger. So one way to to forecast the raw material cost again, you know, the volumes you can do a per ton analysis of how much raw material you spent in the past uh, on making one ton of cement. Uh, and since these commodities are locally available, you know, they may not grow significantly or they may not grow in tandem uh, uh, with global prices. So, and if, even if you look back into the future, the prices that do not seem to vary a lot. So I've grown it very uh, moderately by 3% into the future. And this is the, the, the per ton raw material cost. Again, you remember I have the volumes and I just, multiply this uh, with my volumes assumptions. Uh, there are other ways of looking at it. You can uh, grow this cost by inflation or you can link it to sales. Uh, and if you see a very uh, predictable uh, uh, you know, pattern that raw material cost tends to be a, let's say 15% of your sales, that's the number you can use uh, for this. But here I've used the per ton analysis. For the major cost, which is you know very nearly, or in fact, it's more than half the, the total uh, cost of sales, uh, is your energy cost, the cost of power and uh, fuel that you need to make cement. Uh, and of course, uh, these, these costs are affected by the exchange rate because a lot of these fuels, including oil, are imported into Pakistan. You may be aware that you know global energy prices have overshot significantly. Uh, so you know it is no surprise that the 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 fuel cost 
are expected to be uh, to jump significantly in uh, uh, in in the in this in this year in this fiscal year 2023. Um, and again, I've done a per turn over here, but I'll tell you this: that a cement analyst in our industry would have a very detailed calculation on this one. So uh, the information you need to uh, to forecast this, how much fuel you need per ton of cement, how much oil you need per ton of, uh, uh, to, uh, you know, how much power you need to make one ton of cement, that information is available. You will get it from the companies that you that you are covering for this project. And once you have that, you also have publicly available prices of fuel, whether it's gas, oil, coal, and you would also have assumptions for these commodities. So I know how much I need, how much fuel and power I need per ton of cement. I know their prices. So it's just a decision of how much, what's the mix, how much coal I'm going to use, how much oil I'm going to use. And once you've got that mix uh, and you have the prices, so you can very easily reach a fuel and power cost uh, for any company. But you would have to gather that information, as I said, from the company that you're covering or from, from your primary research or you know, your secondary research. That information is available, so you don't have to worry about that. Uh, and it, let's say if I were grading this a cement model, I expect you to have done that kind of calculation, right? I, I, I would expect you to go into that much detail because this is the most important cost uh, of a cement company in Pakistan. Salaries, they tend to be fixed in nature as opposed to being variable. And when you have a fixed cost, you can assume it to grow by inflation at the minimum. And that's what I've done. I've grown them by inflation. Uh, and other cost, I'd, I'd see if there is uh, there is a relation or with sales which is very nearly consistent over the past, and that's the number I've used. I've, I've taken percentage of sales into the future. I already have forecasted my sales, so I just multiply this number with my uh, forecast for sales, and that's what I've done down below as well, all the way to others. The only cost that uh, that is unique over here is uh, depreciation. As you would imagine, uh, this will come of uh, you know what my fixed asset is uh, in future. So I'll come back to it a little later. But this is going to come from my working on uh, the fixed assets of this company, uh, and I'll do that a little later. As you can see, it is coming off another sheet which is called assets, and where I've uh, forecasted. Uh, the the fixed assets. So that was Cox. Uh, moving on, uh, I've figured out. Uh, I mean, gross profit is just a difference of sales and cost of sales. Uh, the next item is operating expenses, uh, admin expenses, or selling expenses. Now the thing is, you can do you can have a similar approach as this. And if you look at uh, this company's uh, selling and admin expenses, again, you have a long list to deal with. Uh, but what you'd notice is much of that is not material compared to the overall quantum of sales or the overall cost of sales. So the there is not much need for you to go into every single item and figure out how you grow it by inflation or per ton or, you know, I would, uh, in this case, I would just see if it has a consistent relationship with sales as a whole, this group. So admin expenses historically have been very nearly one to 1.5% of sales. Uh, selling expenses have been close to 2% of sales. And I just do that. Again, these are linked to my assumption or my forecast for sales. There is no one stopping you from doing a similar analysis, but it will not lead to more benefit, uh, I would say. But this is a cement company. I do wanna stress here that you, 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 you judge this by, by, uh, by the industry that you're covering. So if you were covering an FMCG, you, that industry has a lot of marketing expense a lot of money spent into selling uh, and advertising and whatnot. 
and you would want to do a more detailed analysis in that sector. In cement, given the quantum and given that, you know, there's not much spent into, uh, uh, you know, selling and admin expenses are also uh, a small component of cost, you know, it's okay to use this approach, but you can do both. Uh, so now I have the operating profit. Again, I want to want to remind you of the DCF rule. So I'm all the way to EBIT. Uh, I, but I still have to go all the way down uh, to, to forecast my, my taxation, also my finance cost, uh, uh, because that will be used in the formula for FCFE. And you do want to know what your earnings are going to be like. This is something that any investor will ask you uh, among the very first questions uh, about any company that you're looking. So other income, uh, other income, you know, if you look at the notes and every time you go into the next line item, check the notes. And you're, in fact, you're expected to have read the entire report from the first cover to the last cover. Uh, but you would check the notes again and see what, where other income is coming from. Now, other income generally is uh, the interest that a company would earn on its surplus cash. Or let's say the company had invested its past surplus cash into uh, T-bills or PIBs or stocks, uh, and it's uh, you know collecting dividends or interest from those investments. So you see where this money is coming from. Uh, and what we find out that this not much of it is coming from the bank account, you know, from cash. Much of it is coming from uh, exchange gains, which uh, is a non-recurring item. Now, recurring, non-recurring, some of these expenses will recur in future, uh, sorry, income or expenses. And some of them are one-time cost or one-time income that you can or you should ignore and do your forecasting without those numbers. So what happened here is the exchange gain uh, came because Pakistani, the rupee depreciated a lot this year uh, in 2022, and they would have exported some of their volumes and would have made the, the differential on, on the dollar. So uh, that's how it made money. But if you're not expecting the rupee to depreciate in this, to the same extent in future, you're not expecting the other income to be as large as it was in 2022. What I do is just to forecast the income that I would earn on cash. So you can leave it, this item till the time you have your cash uh, uh, forecast in the balance sheet, which we'll be, we will do later. But what, I, what I've, I've done is, uh, I've taken uh, the cash balance and multiplied it with uh, the interest rates uh, that I expect into the future. And that's the other income that I've gotten. Um, other charges, this includes uh, such, uh, you know, such expenses as WPPF fund or WWF fund that, that are paid to the employees uh, of a company they tend to be 7% of the profit before tax. So you can just take 7% of the profit before tax, but again, let me warn you that can lead to a circular reference because your profit before tax is derived uh, from other charges. So you can't, you know, you can't do a circular analysis. What you do is you can use EBIT or operating profit and use that as a proxy for your other charges. Uh, so those, for those two line items, you don't really need to make another sheet. And if, you know, but again, it depends on how large those items are and whether or not you consider them to be material. Uh, but this is a simple approach that I've used there. Again, for these, for other income and for uh, other charges, you can do as detailed an analysis as you've done here for cost of sales. So finance cost, as you would imagine, it will depend on uh, my loans, right? Uh, and uh, 
so I need to forecast what my loans are going to be in future. Uh, and that is something I'm going to do later. So this is something that I leave and come back to once I've done uh, my balance sheet. Uh, and since I don't have the 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 the, the finance uh, cost and the other income at this point in time, it's worth going to the next sheet. But let's say you have it. So so taxation is uh, you know it is. Uh, the current tax at least will be 29% uh, of profit before tax. So the, the reg, by, by regulation, Pakistan, uh, the corporate tax rate is 29%. Uh, and on top of that, you will apply 4% uh, 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 poverty alleviation tax. Again, you don't have to remember these numbers. When you get down to tax, all you have to find out uh, from, the, uh, from one of your peers or, or from your instructors or your mentor, of what the, the corporate tax in Pakistan is, let's say it's 29%. So your profit before tax multiplied by 29% is the tax rate for the year. Uh, a bit of caveat there. Uh, so that applies to a company that completely sells locally. If you've got exports, uh, that you know on that you'll pay 1% uh, tax, right? So if a company, uh, is a is an exporter of of something. Uh, let's say the cement company was completely exporting its product, so the tax treatment of this company will be different. It'll be one percent of its turnover, one point two five percent of its turnover. Uh, but if it's a local company, it will have to pay the corporate tax rate, which is twenty nine percent, and any other super tax or any other tax that the government has imposed. Uh, and uh, you know, you can also look into the deferred taxes, but this is um, this is this is something that requires a more detailed discussion. But generally, if a company has done major capex uh, and there is a difference between uh, its uh, depreciation policies for accounting purposes and for tax purposes, there'll be a deferred tax asset or deferred tax liability, and that will uh, affect the effective tax rate of the of the company. And that's something you can look at as well. So so. I've done the taxation and I can come down to my uh, profit after tax. And uh, so uh, I've, I've forecasted what my earnings are going to be like for this company. Earnings per share is just divided by the number of shares of this company, which in this case are 194 million. Uh, and once I have the companies, it's a, uh, you know, it's fairly easy to, uh, uh, to or straightforward to, to, forecast the dividends of this company. So if I look back into the future, again, ignoring the year which was affected by COVID, uh, this company tends to pay out about 15% of its uh, uh, profits. And that is something that I've used into the future. Uh, so I, I already have the earnings. So 15% of them are paid into dividends. And this dividends in million rupees is something that I'm going to use later. And you'll see. So I have, uh, by now, I have uh, 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 the forecasted the income statement uh, of uh, of the company. Uh, I, I hope uh, you've got most of the stuff that I covered. In case you found it a little faster uh, than it should have been, maybe you can look back at it uh, because the recording will be with you later, uh, and uh, you can look back at, at the thing, the individual line items that I've covered here. But before I end the discussion on, on income statement uh, and before I finalize my earnings, again, I want to look, look, at, look at these numbers and see if they make sense. And the one that I'm most concerned about and uh, you know, uh, is, is gross margins or a bit of margins for that matter. So if you look at the gross margins, uh, you know, a, a rule of thumb is uh, for a, you know, it, the company should, generally should not make more profit than it has in the past unless circumstances have changed materially. Uh, and my gross margins are around 21%. Uh, and if I look at the future, the, the past, uh, again, ignoring the, the year affected by COVID, it's average gross margins were close to 24%. Here I've shown you only five years, you, can have, you should have an history of 10 years or so. Uh, but the point is, my gross margins are not 
very different from what this company has made in the past. Again, the immediate years will have its own peculiar economic circumstances. This is a year of contraction. So commodity prices are very high. So it's difficult to sell cement. You know, the cost of your, your input costs are rising very fast. So there is a chance your margins will be lower than uh, the average in the past. So you, you change your numbers accordingly uh, and you revisit your numbers uh, 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 once you've done the income statement and before you go on to the balance sheet. So I think this is the point where we can, we can take a, a short break. Uh, and when we, when we come back, we will uh, uh, cover um, the balance sheet uh, and the rest of the presentation. Okay, so we had, yeah, so, so we're back from the break uh, where uh, we, we have finished forecasting uh, the income statement. Let's move on to the next step, which is uh, the balance sheet. And the balance sheet is, is you know, what where the 80-20 the rule is more visible uh, because a lot of these items, A, are not material, do not affect uh, your earnings in a big way or, uh, or your fair value in a big way. Uh, and some of those items are affected by accrual ac accounting. You know, they're not really cash-based items. Um, and those are the items that we can overlook uh, or ignore. So we don't need to forecast every single item on the balance sheet. We just need to focus on the ones that matters the most to us. And again, recall that the most important ones are uh, the fixed asset, because we need that for the CapEx and the working capital. Uh, and the third item that we also want to worry about is uh, the loans that this company will have, the debt it will have. Uh, as you would know that, you know, the debt would affect its risk profile, et cetera. So let's just start off. And the first one is uh, 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 the fixed asset. Uh, and when you're looking at a fixed asset of a company, uh, so the two things that we will forecast is how much CapEx will it do in the next year and the next forecasted period? And what is the depreciation going to be like? Because that will be the rate at which your fixed asset will be declining, right? So we need to figure that out. And the way to do is that is, uh, uh, let's have a look at the, the what, what sort of information we have in the, in the annual report. So you would see, uh, you know, their additions, their deletions, uh, there's a depreciation, and they've done it for uh, individual items that comprise uh, uh, the, the the fixed assets. But the major ones are plant and machinery and power, uh, and and so those are the major ones, and that they comprise the largest portion of the fixed assets. So we take them together, and if you see that historically what sort of addition rate did it have? So, and, and you have to be mindful of these large additions. So what happened in the past was this company had an expansion. It did one major CapEx, and that's why it's, uh, it's a fixed asset increased by a significant amount. So you, when you're looking into the future, does this company have any cap, major CapEx uh, uh, that it has planned? If it does, what is going to be the cost of that expansion? And when, what is the period during which it will invest that money? Let's say over two two years, three years from now. And those, those pieces of information are available either through the annual report, either through, uh, you know, uh, your interaction with the management or, uh, or you know, the, every company puts notices on the exchange on any big project that they're doing. So you can get the information from there as well. So you would find out if it has a big expansion, if it has a big project, big CapEx, let's say it was investing in a cost efficiency project. And what is the cost of that project? When will it come online? So in this company, we'll see that it is, work, it is, it is doing a small investment or a medium-sized investment right now, which is expected to be completed in the next year. 
and the capital work in progress shows uh, roughly about 3 billion. So capital work in progress is what <laughs> will ultimately become the fixed asset. So you've got a good guide there that how much money will come into the additions next year. Otherwise, what do we do later? So when the last project is over, uh, <clears throat> what do we do about the, uh, the additions? We can't take a large project every year because that's going to drain the cash and the resources of the company. So once you're through these large projects, uh, what we need is what sort of maintenance CapEx does this company do? So we look back into the future and see what sort of maintenance CapEx or non-large CapEx it has done. And that seems to be around two to 3% of its book value. Okay. So that number you can use and that's going to be your maintenance CapEx that on a recurring basis every year to maintain the plant, uh, it is spending that much uh, on the plant. Similarly, if you look at the depreciation, <clears throat> this tends to be a very consistent and non-variable sort of number as a percentage of the current value of the fixed assets, right? So, so historically, again, I've been showing you five years here, but you can look at this at your company for 10 years or so, and you may see <clears throat> similar consistency so the depreciation rate tends to be about four to five percent of its <coughs> book value of of its fixed assets, and again you can use that number into the future. You can be a little more detailed with this. So I've done it for the entire club together, the entire uh, fixed assets. You can do this the, the similar calculation for each and every item of uh, the property plan and equipment, and sum them and ultimately you will end up with similar results. That's up to you whether you want to go into that detail. Sometimes you've got different kinds of fixed assets. Let's say you were looking at a company like Shell, the, you know, they've got pumps, they've got storage uh, uh, tankers, they've got lorries. So they've got different kind of fixed assets and you want to look at them separately. So in that case, you would want to do this analysis on a more detailed uh, line by line item. Uh, but it's also, a general practice to to take fixed assets together and look at them this way that we've done here. So before we leave the sheet, we've got what sort of capex it will do in the near future and over the next four or five years, and what sort of depreciation it will have uh, uh, in uh, in future. This you would remember will go into the income statement. We will also need depreciation other places. Uh, um, and the addition rate will give us, help us uh, with the capex that this company is doing. And as you remember, this is one of the, the three items that we need to value this company. So we've got the capex so far. Back to the balance sheet. Again, uh, the other, the other non-current assets seem to be immaterial <clears throat> or uh, not, like I said, they they don't seem to affect my earnings or my fair value. So I am I have two choices. Whether I focus them in a very mild manner, maybe link them to inflation or link them to my volume sales, stuff like that, <laughs> or just keep them flat. I choose to keep them flat because some of these items can affect my working capital, right? And uh, I want to have maximum control on the working capital <laughs> forecast that I have for this company. So I choose to keep these numbers flat uh, and they will not affect my cash flow projections, my earnings projections in any way, uh, uh, right? So the next, the next key item is uh, uh, working capital. Uh, working capital uh, is the difference between current assets and current liabilities. And to be specific, accounts receivables, inventory, stores and sp spares, payables. And now let's focus these items uh, more carefully. So how you go about them is you take them individually uh, and you take, either you can take them as a percentage of sales or the better approach is to use uh, turnovers. So accounts receivables, turnover, days of accounts receivable, days of inventory, days of payable. 
and uh, and that's something that's also very uh, understandable right how much how many days of receivables does it have or inventory does it have so let's say this company used to have 20 plus days of inventory but more recently its inventory has been falling uh, or it's maintaining uh, a, a, a you know a smaller inventory and uh, similarly you know a, a receivables they they seem to be selling more on cash they <clears throat> get back their cash in five days uh, <clears throat> so not many days for receivables uh, I can tell you this you know this is uh, to have such numbers is a blessing uh, for many sectors and industries that we uh, that we deal with uh, in the industry the working capital is is you know is more uh, erratic, more variable. So, you know, they, you can see companies with 100 days of inventories and 100 days of receivables, and the next year it changes. So, you have to be more careful when, when you deal with that. But this is a very straightforward industry, straightforward company. So, the working capital cycle don't seem to vary much. Fair. So, I'm going to use those numbers uh, into the future. So, I'm taking uh, five, five and a half days of, in, uh, of receivables, 15 days of inventory. Uh, they are linked to either my my net sales or my uh, cost of sales or purchases, those numbers, as you remember, I've already forecasted. So I just have to link them, the turnovers to, do, to those numbers. Like for example, here, it's the, the, the revenue uh, that has been linked uh, and that gives me the accounts receivable for, uh, for the future based on the sales that I, that I have. Uh, similarly, payables, same same approach. Uh, I will link it to my cost of sales uh, and number of days of payables about 40 to 50 days, and I'm going to use that into the future. They seem they're very consistent over the past, um, and uh, I'm going to use the same number. <clears throat> but again, you keep in mind what sort of macro situation you're in. Probably your this year is going to be contraction. The GDP is slowing. So maybe inventories are building up, maybe they're not selling as much, so the, uh, the receivable days can increase. So that is the thought process that you can incorporate. So let's say in this year you can expect, or you can keep your inventory, uh, sorry, your receivables days higher, maybe 10 days, or inventory days about 25, 30 days, because you don't expect them to sell very swiftly uh, in, a, in, in, a, in a period where the economy is contracting. So that goes into your, into your assumption. So you don't just take one number and, and you know extrapolate it or, or stretch it further. You also change and tweak them for individual years based on what you expect uh, uh, for the for the sector, for the economy, for the industry, and for this company in particular. So uh, <clears throat> once we've forecasted these numbers and we take them back to the balance sheet, so, they, so these numbers are coming off the working capital sheet. Uh, and now I'm in a position to do my working capital calculation. So I've got the current assets, current liabilities, working capital is a change of them, and change in working capital is, is the number that I'm more, more uh, interested in uh, because this will go into my valuations, uh, right? So we've done another component of, uh, uh, of our uh, fair value formula. <clears throat> Coming back to balance sheet, again, you might notice that I've used that, I've taken some numbers to stay flat. These are these are all those numbers which are uh, uh, based on accrual accounting or not material, uh, and I don't expect them to affect my earnings and cash flows uh, materially in future. You, have, you would have similar uh, numbers uh, in non-current uh, liabilities and current liabilities. So let's talk about liabilities, right? You've got long-term loans and you've got current portion, you've got uh, short-term borrowing, trade payables, we've already forecasted. So there is another sheet called loans. So what happens in loans is when you look into the accounts, they would give you a breakup of uh, what those loans are. So for example, you're looking at the long-term financing note and they tell you that the company is telling you that we've got these loans. And what I need is that for each loan, what is the tenor? When I'm paying back, what is the period 
uh, for which I uh, have this loan? What is the interest rate that I have to pay on this loan? Uh, and that information is available in the notes that follow uh, uh, this note, right? Uh, so you have you have that information for each and every loan. So once you once you once you collect that information, you, what you do is you start making a, a loan schedule for each and every loan that this company has, right? So, and you just start with the beginning value or the ending value that you had uh, for this year and you go forward, right? So when I read the note, I know that about 14 payments remain. Uh, and I'm what I'm doing is I'm, I, I will find out what my quarterly payments will be. They're spread out evenly. Uh, so I'm paying uh, about 625 million out of this loan every quarter. And I have to pay this much interest every quarter, yeah, right? Which is de-annualized. Uh, so this is my interest rate. It's this, this particular loan has a spread of 0.7% over Kaibor. Uh, I already have Kaibor assumptions as you remember from the, mat, from the assumption sheet. Uh, I just add the spread and link it to my loan schedule. Uh, so that gives me the interest per quarter for, for this loan. And I repeat this exercise for the next three quarters until the end of year. So until the end of year, this loan has shrunk to about 6.2 billion. It started off from 8.7 billion. During the year, I paid interest of roughly about a billion rupees and I've repaid 2.5 billion rupees out of this loan. Current portion is the amount I'll pay next year. Since, the, since I have the entire schedule, I just have to uh, stretch the formula. Uh, I know how much I'll pay next year. That'll be my current maturity of this loan. Uh, so, and you repeat this exercise for each and every loan that this company has, right? What tenor? what interest rates uh, and how many payments remain. And uh, uh, this is a very simple exercise. You, you will have, you will make the loan schedule for all of them. Once you've done that, just sum them up. So this is the sum of all the ending balances of uh, all the loans that I have. Uh, similarly, interest payments and uh, principal that I paid this year and the current maturity. So, for the balance sheet, this item uh, goes on the long-term loans go here. This is the sum of the ending balances of all the loans. Current portion comes here. Uh, Short-term borrowing is a different matter. Uh, Short-term borrowing depends on your working capital. I'll come back to it a little later because it is something that I will do right at the end of this, uh, uh, of this presentation. And of course, the interest that you've paid on these loans will go into your um, into your income statement. Um, all right, so so we've done the loans as well. If you look at equity, I'm jumping because some of these items I've taken flat, right? So I'm not really skipping those. I haven't forecasted them, and that's not just for this presentation. I would have done it for my clients too. Uh, I would not have wasted my time on items that I don't expect to uh, um, be material. Uh, so in the equity portion, the share capital remains the same. Uh, the share premium remains the same. This is the number of shares it has, the par value. Uh, those numbers are not changing unless the company announces a bonus or rights share. This one hasn't. Uh, retained earnings is the is one thing that I have to change for the next year. And it's essentially beginning value of retail earnings plus the profit for the year minus dividends for the year, right? So the residual amount, whatever money you retained are, is added back over here. Okay, so what, what I've left here is cash and short-term borrowings uh, in the balance sheet. So before I complete my balance sheet, I'll have to move on to the next sheet because I can't uh, I can't forecast cash on its own. I'll have to do a whole working for it. So when you do cash flows, uh, over here, this is a very condensed form of the indirect method. Uh, uh, 
uh, of of cash flows right uh, and as you see uh, it start uh, again i don't have to take you through the 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 the, the layout but you see uh, the more important thing to remember is the cash flow must capture both the income statement and the balance sheet entirely right remember that rule that the cash flow statement should be to be uh, constructed in a manner that it reflects all the changes in my income statement and in my balance sheet okay so these two items are taking care of the income statement very well so the most important number out of that now of, out of that sheet the net, the net profits are here right uh so the end result is already reflected i add back depreciation which is also coming from the income statement now everything else is balance sheet everything else that's reflected here is coming from the balance sheet and i have to make sure that every line item on the balance sheet is reflected here what i mean by that is that all of these rows must be reflected in my cash flow statement if i miss anything or i double count anything then i will have a cash balance which will not balance my in my balance sheet uh and let me tell you if your balance sheet is not balanced this is a model worth not not worth looking at it's not reliable it's incomplete uh so you there is no way uh you can get away with the model where the balance sheet is not balancing so you must strive to have the balance sheet balance and for that you need to make sure that your cash number is correct right and like i said if you if you omit any one of these items on the cfs or you double count them uh you're going to end up with a wrong number so once you once you uh completed uh this exercise and you don't end up with the right number that you should have on the balance sheet then the way to go back is have i taken care of all the rows on my balance sheet so the working capital would have taken care of the 5 6 rows you know the other check the other formulas are all the rows except for the totals of course and except for the lines which were empty uh are all the rows taken the right way uh the other thing is the other mistake that you can make is something that should have been a positive cash event you've taken that negative right or vice versa so capex uh over here is shown positive but of course on the cash flow statement it should it should be negative so you have you should have a minus sign here so increase in assets is a cash drain so they should be negative uh likewise increase in borrowing is a positive cash event and that should be taken positively over here i am actually reducing my borrowings so my cash is going out and hence a negative uh, balance here so the sum of cfo cfi and cff uh, is the net cash uh, flow you have the beginning cash flow you end uh, end up with an uh, with an ending value you take it to your balance sheet and you should end up balancing your balance sheet so there is no difference between the total assets and the total liabilities and equity right if that is not the case you made some mistake go back and check right uh and the other thing is short term borrowings again you can you can forecast them uh um uh, just the way you did loans but uh the reason why we don't forecast short term borrowings and i've taken them as a as a direct punch in number uh i've i've what i do is sometimes your cash is negative and what you need to do is you increase your borrowings to ensure that your cash is positive uh because your your model is telling you that this company needs borrowing to ensure that it needs that it has more cash so this is the the last final item it it is not the one which will balance the sheet but it was it is something that will increase and decrease the cash balance uh and if you have negative cash which is very possible because your working capital is such that is draining cash and 
your capex was a large one so you, you must have borrowed enough uh, so you adjust your borrowings right at the end of the balance sheet working so uh, by now we've completed the balance sheet and uh, we've at the same time we've also done the C, uh, the cash flow statement uh, as far as this sheet is concerned there are two purposes of this sheet one is to balance the balance sheet that is critical but otherwise it's a, it's a it's got very limited use we only use it to uh, read where the cash uh, is is being utilized or uh, where the cash sources are so you just want to read that for that information otherwise the, the use of this sheet is limited right uh, we're left with one step and that is valuing the company so i i already told you uh, the formula so we've got uh, uh, the EBIT, depreciation, it's coming off the, the asset schedule. This is coming off, uh, EBIT is coming from the income statement, taxation again, income statement, uh, working capital we've already done, the change in working capital, a CapEx we've done through the, that through the asset schedule. And I've got everything that I need to calculate the, the FCFF. If I had, if I were calculating FCFE, I would also need net borrowing, but no problem. I've got that number two. I've got change in borrowing from here. So you can bring that here and this can be your formula for FCFE. And you can take interest out uh, and so on. So anyways, so once you've got the FCFF for the next five years uh, and the last very last cash flow, the terminal year, you will have the terminal value uh, I, I hope you you have uh, you know you you're aware of that. Uh, if not, that's something you can look up and uh, come back to. But anyways, you've got your cash flows, and now I want to discount them, right? And what is my discount rate going to be? Uh, uh, since I'm using FCFF, I will have to discount it with weighted average average cost of capital. If it were FCFE, of course, I'll have cost of equity. Uh, so for that, I need uh, the the capital structure. Again, for this company, the capital structure has been is variable, and I'm expecting it to have much less debt than it has had in the past. But prudently, I'll set my debt capital structure in a way that it will that this company will continue to have debt. So for you know, in future, it might go into another project, uh, another expansion, another investment. And for that, it might raise debt. So historically, I've seen it tends to remain or have uh, about at least 30% of uh, its assets are, are financed through debt. So that's my capital structure. Uh, and again, cost weighted cost of equity, uh, cost of debt is after tax uh, cost on your loans. As you remember from the loan schedule, most of its loans had a spread of 0.5% over Kybor. I'm taking the same rate and I, this is after tax uh, cost. So that's my cost of debt, cost of equity, uh, CAPM formula, uh, risk free rate. It is the, the roughly the interest rate that you have on the 10 year PIB. You need a long term security for a risk free rate. Uh, this is something that you can debate with your faculty instructor uh, or your mentor and you know, and you will decide which number to take for your risk free rate, your market risk premium, and the beta. And the beta for this company is high. It's 1.4 because cement companies are cyclical. They move close with the economy. Uh, uh, and, you know, they have, their stock prices have uh, bigger movements than the market on average. So they have a higher beta. So uh, the, the cost of equity for this company is 21%. And the VAC for is 17%. Again, you know, uh, I would uh, take the, the the present value of my FCFF, which are summed here, present value of my uh, terminal value. Since I have taken FCFF, this is not the equity value. I will have to take debt out. And uh, uh, this is the, the most recent reported debt, the long-term debt, the short-term debt, the current portion, so only interest bearing debt, okay? Not the entire liabilities are taken out here, adjusted for any cash this company has. So this is net debt. 
uh, I'm left with this value, and this is giving me a fair value of uh, 201 rupees per share. Uh, the stock price of this particular stock is about 129.75. And as you know, this is suggesting that I buy the stock because my fair value is higher than the market price based on my estimates, based on my assumptions. Uh, and here uh, we end uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, you know, uh, the financial model. So we have uh, the earnings forecasted for the future, and we have an estimate for the fair value based on which I can make a judgment or whether this is something I want to buy or sell or advise my clients to buy or sell, right? Okay, so uh, that, was the, that was the model. Before we end this presentation, I want to uh, go through uh, some best practices that you should have in mind when you're making your own model. Uh, first of all, keep it neat, tidy, clean. Uh, so there's no rough work here, right? Uh, there's one single font that I've used throughout the model. So the numbers are not, you know, uh, visibly, uh, they're not changing, right? Uh, the forecasts are, are shown highlighted, you know, so that uh, they're easy to find, easy to jump onto when you look into this sheet. Uh, the columns are evenly, uh, you know, divided, stuff like that. So make sure this is an aesthetically pleasing model. It doesn't have to be very colorful, but the presentation of it should be such that it's easy for me to read, it's easy for me to go through. Uh, uh, when, you're, when you're taking your historicals, please uh, use millions uh, instead of taking the whole numbers because they're easier to read uh, than billions or you know than, than a large number. So present your numbers here in millions, right? So that's, that's about keeping the model clean, nice and tidy. Uh, well, for today's presentation, as you see, there are at least 10 sheets that I've presented here, but your model can be much less number of sheets. So, you know, a different structure, the income statement balance sheet, uh, and uh, the CFS can all be on one sheet. So one after the other, uh, and you don't need different sheets for them. Uh, likewise, a sales and cost of sales or printing expenses, you can have that working below your assumptions. So, you know, uh, so that this is a concise model. It's up to you. Whatever you think is the right approach. If there is a sector uh, where there's a lot of products uh, and, you know, there's a lot of data that you have to input, perhaps a longer model or more number of sheets are appropriate. Uh, in this case, it's a simple model, one product. Uh, so you can keep your model short, keep it concise. Uh, uh, there's, uh, there's no hard and fast rule, which is better, uh, but you know, there are, these are different approaches to how you can structure the model. Uh, again, reader friendliness, you know, by reader friendliness, there can be that, they can, that can mean a lot of things. It, it's not just clean, it's got a very logical projection uh, progression. So when you start about the sector, you start with the industry, what sort of market share, what sort of volumes, prices. So it's, it's got a thought process that any average person would think, right? So you make the model in that manner. It's not as if it, this sheet starts with the prices, there's a market share and volumes are all the way down. So you have to scroll all the way up and down the model that's low on reader friendliness. So make it intuitive, just make it the way someone would think about this company and anticipate what numbers they want to focus on and make them prominent. Um, avoid circular references. I will go back to uh, my sales uh, uh, working and the prices. And you see the reason why I didn't use it because my, my, many of my costs were using sales to be forecasted, right? 
and over here i'm using cost to forecast my sale price so that will be a circular error right and the moment i make that error excel will pop it up here and it's not a great sign when someone opens your model uh so don't have it in your model the way to check that is uh you know you can check it over here uh, again in the interest of time i will not go through it but don't have any circular references other ways that you can have circular reference is that other income is derived from the cash of the same year so this is linked to the cash of the same year why is that a problem because as you remember the cash is derived from other in, uh, from net income and you are using the same number to forecast the net income right because it's one portion of the net income so it lead to a circular error problem uh, so you don't want to do that either uh, so i guess that's about it the one last thing that i will share uh, before we head into q and a uh, a good practice is that in every sheet a single column correspond to the same year so 2018 in every sheet is column d why you want to do that because when you are linking between sheets you don't want to make an error so instead of d i linked it with c the previous year and that gives me an erroneous number right but when i check the formula and i i see it instead of d it is a c column i know i have made that mistake so keep your columns consistent so that when you link sheets you don't make that mistake which is very possible when you're dealing with so many numbers and you when you're making models for the first time all right uh one last thing uh what will your graders if you, anyone looking at your model will assess when they look at your model uh, besides the thing that i already covered uh how much you understand the industry and company and that will that will come across when they see which numbers you focused on which variables you focused on uh the structure of the model again i don't need to go through that again and they will look at your estimates remember i had that discussion on gross margin so you do that throughout the model whether your numbers are conservative or they're aggressive or they're somewhere in the middle you would want it, them to be somewhere in the middle they're not uh imprudent um and that's about it uh uh so i guess i'll leave you with this that a good financial model is detailed easy to read and sensible so now we can open the floor for question and answers if you have any questions uh, i think purana or dania will moderate uh, i guess you might have to raise your hands purana please uh, help us with that um so sir they're going to type in their questions in the chat box and uh, you can uh, read off from the chat box but if you want okay. me to moderate i can do that okay okay so i'll go through the the question that you've writ written um so so i can take the first question yes you have to submit your financial model uh, with the research report there are no separate marks for the financial model but it is considered as a supporting document i i uh, i just i just jump on to one of one of these questions i'm sorry you won't be able to share this file with you because in the interest of competition uh we will not be able to share the model uh but of course you can look at the recording again and you know much of what we covered here you can pick it up again from there is it possible to, possible to have a higher risk free rate than market return high risk free rate you know with some certainty because you look at government securities which have very low risk uh, and you know the return on them you know you know the return on the fixed income securities right but as far as market return is concerned that's expected return so what do you expect in future so can you can you earn less on the equity market than risk free rate very possible very possible in in a year where the economy is contracting most of these industries are not doing well uh, interest rates are high uh, the, the the business is you know it's hard to do business in pakistan so most of you know there is very possible that you might not earn uh, a return on the market which is better than the risk free rate 
but that's you know that's expected uh it might turn out to be different so you know that once the year is over right you you can't be uh, sure of that when you start the year but risk free rate is something that you lock in when you invest in a fixed income security uh how how do we value assets in emerging markets in pakistan with uh, with a uh, unstable foreign exchange that's a very valid question uh uh some of that is taken care of by your risk premium so the risk premium for pakistan equities is 6% it does not need to be that high uh and the required rate of return in let's say the, the cost of equity was 21% if you remember as fairly high i mean that's if 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 a if a stock is not giving you at least 21% uh uh you will not invest in that stock so your discount rate is taking care of the risk of investing in pakistan market from the perspective of a foreign investor right if you are based in pakistan all equities are valued with that risk premium um and then you have to look at stock specific or industry specific risk you are you can only invest in pakistan but if you have the choice of investing between markets you have the option of keeping a high risk premium or discount rate when you're valuing companies in pakistan which will take care of that additional risk that you take take on and another way of uh, dealing with that problem is keep your estimates very very conservative don't be very aggressive about your growth assumptions or what you expect in the future so keep your estimates very conservative if they come out higher good for you if not you were conservative to start with but the key assumptions of of course uh, you, you have to take a terminal growth rate and you can use you you have a formula with you know what's the payout ratio are going to be what's the retention ratio are going to be what sort of rois it has had in the past you can you can either use that formula uh, but a rule of thumb is you know somewhere around less than 5% or whatever uh, is going to be uh, you know the normal gdp growth rate uh, over a long term for pakistan so you can argue that it, it should be higher than 3% but ultimately this will be an immature industry cement right uh, it will not be a high growth industry like a consumer industry or technology and you know it's fair to take a very uh, uh, a, a, a conservative number for your terminal growth rate see and also bear in mind that half of the value i've gone back to the model half of the value uh, nearly half of that value is coming from a terminal value and this is one drawback that you have with ecs so be very careful when you whatever growth rate you take in your terminal year so it should need not be so high that let's say 70 80% of your value is coming from terminal year so which is why we've taken 3% but again that's something you should uh, discuss with your mentor uh, and your faculty instructor when you are finalizing your estimates i'm not sure what you mean by how do we quantify qualitative strategies in model building but uh well if i get your question correctly uh whatever perceptions you have of what expectations you have of an industry that let's say um we're looking at the auto industry uh and uh, let's say we're looking at kia for example and they come out with a new model of uh, of a car and you go to the market you survey and you understand from that survey that this model will not sell very well you know there are some product flaws and it's not it's it's too pricey so that that qualitative expectation can reflect in your numbers right you can adjust your sales in that manner uh and that will affect uh what sort of uh, earnings you have and eventually the the fair value of the company so you 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 bring in that research which is mostly qualitative into your numbers 
you know you beta you can you can calculate there is a specific, there is a formula you would have uh, taken that in your uh, course on security analysis otherwise uh, if uh, in your college you have access to reuters or bloomberg bloomberg terminal they give you beta very easily so you can fetch the beta both adjusted and unjust, unadjusted from uh, bloomberg or reuters if you have access to those terminals at 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 your schools uh, you or you can take help from your mentors or faculty instructor but even if, if even if you know if you don't have those uh, if you don't get it from those sources you can calculate it you just have to get the market price in which you can get from psx website uh, and you can calculate beta very easily uh, i won't i'm sorry i won't be able to take you through that calculation uh, today, but yes, you can calculate beta. How to uh, implement? Sir, uh, yes. Uh, sir, sorry, sorry for the interruption. Actually, CRP Institute is going to uh, give all the participants access to the reference platform. Oh, very nice. If if you are referring to that, yeah. So once yeah, they complete yeah. their registration, uh, that most of the students have already done, they will automatically yeah. uh, give them access to the reference. Oh, great, great. Okay. The reference is what Reuters was. Yeah, yeah, now. yes, exactly. Yes, that's perfect. So you can get you can get that information from there, and a lot more information actually. I hope you guys use that resource very well. How to implement the higher risk rate than market return in CAPM? Will it be considered again? Your discount rate is high as it is. The so risk free rate plus a very high risk premium. So you're demanding twenty five percent from this stock. If the stock is not giving that, uh, it will not give you a fair value which is higher than the market price and so the discount rate will take care of that you're already demanding a high return on the stock and that's what the discount rate is for it's already higher than the risk fee rate and what the stock returns you'll find out in a year's time but when you start off investing you start off with an expected return or a required return on that stock Okay, how I mean, government policy. Uh, how do we incorporate government policies uh, for a specific industry? They can be uh, taxation. They can be uh, well, most most likely they're not. They're taxation and import duties on their raw materials. So so that's how you can bring what the government uh, what policy the government has. For example, the government is subsidizing the fuel prices for the cement industry. For example. Or uh, you know, giving some other protection, like for example, for example, they're giving them subsidized loans. So you, when you research on the industry, you'll know. And uh, let's say if they are getting subsidized loan, you you'll automatically in your loan schedule put a lower interest rate. Uh, so that 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 depends on your research. What sort of government incentives are there for the cement sector or for any other sector uh, that you're making the model of? How do we qualitatively incorporate ESG in valuation? Again, it's qualitatively. Uh, qualitatively, I'm not sure if you can do that in valuation. If a company is involved in an industry where carbon emissions are high, probably you start off uh, on the wrong side. Uh, so maybe that if you are ESG compliant or if you are if you don't want to invest in in you know environmentally non-compliant stocks. Uh, qualitatively, you would know, uh, but you know. Otherwise, you would look at what sustainable sustainability projects a certain company is doing uh, uh, to to reduce its carbon carbon footprints. Right? Uh, I don't think you can completely eliminate a company from uh, environmental issues, especially in Pakistan. Right? You know, it's not a developed country, but you can. Do that qualitative analysis by looking at what sort of projects they are doing, and they would have it in their annual report. Some large cement companies or companies in other industries, for example, Engro, would have a proper sustainability report telling you what exactly they are doing to reduce their carbon footprint. And it's up for you to decide whether that's enough. Uh, and uh, and uh, let's say if it's not enough, you would want 
probably you would want to increase your risk premium uh, or your discount rate to take to 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 take care of that. But that is more qualitative than quantitative. Uh, possible. Inevitably, Om, your forecast will not match uh, the company's estimates. The best you can do is come close, and uh, you will be judged on if you were directionally right. So, if you said that earnings may fall by as much as twenty to thirty percent. If they actually fall by 40%, you were still very close. You were still right, right? You don't have to be perfect in this. It's not a perfect world, I told you that, right? But you, you're judged on how close you were to actual numbers. Uh, and if you were directionally right, so if you're expecting earnings to decline sharply, they didn't decline at all, they were flat, then you were, you were incorrect in your forecast. So it's not, it's not like how, how accurate you were, but if you were, you know, in the right direction and you were telling the right stuff to your investors and clients. DDM model, uh, whether you should use DDM model, is that more appropriate for DCF? Again, very simple answer. If a company has a very uh, uh, consistent payout policy, that its payout ratio stays the same every year, two, and two, it's, it pays out most of its earnings, like its payout ratio is at least 70% or more. And three, you know that investors invest in this stock for dividends. They're not looking for growth, they've invested in this stock for dividends. These are three criteria for which, which, will, uh, for which you should use DDM. Because the stock, is, uh, the, 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 the value driver is dividends, not earnings. Uh, so for that stock, DDM is more appropriate. For D, for uh, cement, none of those apply, right? Cement is a growth sector uh, in an emerging economy. Uh, payout policy is not consistent. When they've got large projects, they cut back on dividends, uh, and they don't have a payout ratio of 80%, 90% on a sustain, consistent basis. Key assumptions for CapEx uh, were uh, your addition rate. You can look back into the future and you, you can read uh, what plans the company has in terms of future investments. And that'll be the best guide of what your CapEx is going to be. Um, let's say if, uh, in the industry, we, we, would, we will call up the management. We will uh, ask them in their analyst briefings what their CapEx plans are. If it's not a, if it's not a year where they'll be investing a large amount of money, we'll we can forecast maintenance capex and based on what the history was like. How do we consider sustainability in valuation? Again, you know that that's more qualitative uh, than quantitative, uh, and I think that uh, most companies, certainly not cement sector in Pakistan, uh, can be can score highly on sustainability. Some of these companies are investing in sustainability. For example, Lucky Cement uh, is. Uh, you need to you need to research on that and decide whether your company is you know doing enough on ESG. It's already in a sector which has a high carbon footprint because it uses coal. Uh, so it's not a great starting point, but you know you can see what what they're doing to reduce their carbon emissions. And I think I think we can take one more question before um, we can end sure. the presentation. Sure, sure. If, if there are any questions, I think we can take one more question. Averaging the depreciation for forecasting is right and enough. Um, depreciation rate, as I told you, uh, tends to be very consistent. They don't vary a lot because uh, it depends on the life of the plant, which when you, when, you, when you invested in that plant was 25, 30 years. 
and on a on you, that doesn't change every year right the life of the plant doesn't change much you would have invested into the into the plant and sort of increased the life of the plant by a few years but you know it won't drastically change your depreciation rate so you can rely on whatever depreciation rate you had in the past uh but the, the comp in the notes you would also find what each element of the fixed asset what depreciation rate is appropriate I've already answered whether DDM is a better approach. Uh, I don't think for a cement company. I have also told you what criteria you you uh, you should judge whether uh, the model is appropriate uh, for cement uh, for cement industry. I guess uh, that's about it.